Hello and welcome everyone. Today I'm going to be introducing three NCBI resources to navigate testing for disease-linked variants, MedGen, GTR, and ClinVar. I'd first like to review the objectives for the presentation. Um, after today, I'm hoping that you'll be able to locate relevant professional guidelines in at least two of the demonstrative resources, to be able to compare methodologies between tests for the same condition, and to review the clinical significance for a sequence variant. And you'll be able to accomplish these objectives using the NCBI resources MedGen, GTR, and ClinVar. So I'm going to show you several different resources that can assist you in the various phases of the testing lifecycle, from researching clinical findings, gathering a diagnosis differential, initiating appropriate testing, and then finally reviewing the clinical significance of any variants found during testing. My goal is that you'll find several resources relevant to your practice. And while there may be other resources out there that also provide the information I'll be covering, today I'm going to re I'm going to focus on resources that are free and that are accessible to healthcare professionals. And my final slide will provide the URLs for any covered resources. So again, the three resources that we're highlighting are MedGen, GTR, and ClinVar. Before we delve into a case study, I'd like to begin with a quick introduction to each resource. So MedGen is NCBI's medical genetics portal, and it holds and focuses on information on conditions with a genetic component. The NIH Genetic Testing Registry, or the GTR, is a registry of available genetic tests for heritable and somatic changes in humans, which are voluntarily provided by testing laboratories. And ClinVar is an archival database containing assertions of clinical significance for variants and their relationship to phenotypes. So we're going to follow a case example through the testing life cycle to help illustrate how to use the presented resources. Today's case involves a nine-year-old boy who is referred to genetics after a routine sports physical uncovers a concerning family history. With a paternal uncle with sudden cardiac death at age 52 and a paternal grandmother who died during childbirth. And so you want to do some background reading to prepare for this case. So you decide to start researching conditions that are possibly correlated with an aortic dissection. And to do so, I'd like to introduce you to MedGen. So MedGen is a new resource to NCBI, which again provides information on conditions with a genetic component. It integrates information from many sources, including OMIM, Gene Reviews, PubMed, Genetics Home Reference, and many others. And some of MedGen's features include the ability to search by clinical findings in order to gather a differential diagnosis, quick access to professional guidelines, and transparency and cohesion between phenotype nomenclatures and disease hierarchies. So since I'm a little unsure of what possible conditions could be responsible for this patient's family history, I'm going to start by using the MedGen Advanced Search. From the home page, I click the link under the main search bar shown here as Advanced. The Advanced Search Builder allows users to create very specific searches. In our case, I'll use the field pull-down menu to select clinical features. I'll type in aortic dissection as a clinical feature and then click the show index list to compare what I've entered to the known feature list in MedGen. So this now shows some possible matches to my term. I'm going to select the top term, aortic dissection, with 18 associated results. I can then add additional search terms if I want, and when I'm finished, I can click the search button to execute my command. So this result page shows the 18 hits that have aortic dissection as a clinical feature. I can scan through the list, or I can click, click a particular condition to learn more about it. The result list is weighted, so I decide to start my reading with the top hit for Marfan syndrome. And here's a MedGen phenotype record. I'll point out that several identifiers are mentioned, including the SNOMED CT name, which allows for interoperability with electronic medical records. One of MedGen's missions is to provide a unified nomenclature system for phenotypes, and it integrates condition names from resources such as UMLS, 
NOMAD CT, HPO, and OMIM. Next is the disease characteristics section, which is populated with information from Gene Reviews articles if, that, if they're available. And plus, it also has additional descriptions from OMIM and the Genetics Home Reference, among others. Moving down the page, we find the clinical features section where we can review other possible features to look for when our patient is in clinic. Scrolling further down the page provides the term hierarchy section with two hierarchies discoverable by clicking either tab. The GTR hierarchy is manually curated while the MedGen hierarchy is provided from, by MeSH. And from here, you can click to review other associated conditions. So in our case, if we went through and reviewed all the links, you'd find that one symptom, bifid uvula, is a distinguishing feature between EDS type 4 and Marfan syndrome. And you can remember to look for that when the patient is with you in clinic. And a lot of people find this section is very useful when studying for a board exam. Continuing to move down the Marfan syndrome page in MedGen, you'll come to a section on professional guidelines. You can take note of the ACMG guideline to evaluating the patient with Marfanoid features. So beneath the professional guidelines section are suggested reading and recent clinical studies. The reference under suggested reading is manually curated, and so you decide to review this reference. While reading this paper, you decide to print out the scoring system for the clinic visit. Continuing back to the top of the Marfan syndrome page in MedGen, I'd like to point out the wealth of information that can be found in the discovery panel located on the right-hand side of most pages. The first section allows for quick navigation to the sections of the page we just reviewed. The second section provides a direct link to tests available for Marfan syndrome in the NIH Genetic Testing Registry. The discovery panel con continues down the side of the page, and I'd like to quickly take some time to highlight some of the linked resources. There are molecular resources that focus on additional information for the FBN1 gene associated with Marfan syndrome. You can go to the OMIM gene record or get even more detailed gene information in RefSeq gene. You can view FBN1 variations in ClinVar and NCBI's Variation Viewer or link to Coriel's database. And there are consumer resources as well, and these provide easy way to get information that's printable for your patient. So here's a screenshot of Genetics Home Reference with the print version easily accessible. The information available here is listed at the top of the page. The Office of Rare Diseases Research provides GARD, or the Genetic and Rare Disease Information Center. And one of my favorite parts of the GARD program is this website, which allows users to submit questions about genetic conditions, which are answered by genetic counselors on staff. Medline Plus is another cool consumer resource and is of particular use to you if you need images and videos to supplement your clinic discussions. So back to MedGen and our discovery panel, there are also links to, um, to phenotypes in the PubMed Health Medical Encyclopedia, which is powered by Adam. So clicking the link here for Pectus excavatium reveals detailed information on the phenotype, including pictures. So we just saw a page from PubMed Health for a clinical feature, but the discovery panel also provides links to the PubMed Health record itself as well as links to clinicaltrials.gov for open research studies. There are further sections on the discovery panel for navigating to gene reviews, review articles in PubMed, and a CAN search in PubMed clinical queries. If you haven't used PubMed clinical queries before, it provides a really nice way to discover relevant articles. Uh, there's even more information that you can look into as well uh, if you haven't yet found what you're looking for. So back to the top of the page, I'll point out the links to the genetic testing registry. I'm not going to take you there just yet, but I did want to show you that the connections are there. 
So one more quick way to get a differential diagnosis in MedGen is to use the search bar and search for a single clinical feature. The advanced search is better when you have multiple features that you wish to look for. So here, if I search for aortic dissection, I'm taken to the MedGen page for this disease feature. I can quickly look at the conditions with this feature section, and there I have my disease differential. And clicking any of these links will provide me with more information on each condition. So the boy arrives in clinic with his mother. He has a past medical history of an atrial septal defect of birth which has since resolved. He has a congenital inguinal hernia, which was surgically repaired. He does have myopia and needs to wear glasses. He has dental malocclusion, and his dentist has already dis discussed braces with his mother. Uh, his mother does report that he bruises easily. And during physical exam, it's noticed that his breastbone appears sunken in. He does have a reduced upper segment to lower segment ratio. You also note that he exhibits arachnodactyly, but a quick check reveals that he does not have bifid uvula. So, so far your differential diagnosis contains Marfan syndrome, EDS type 4, and several subtypes of Lewis Dietz syndrome. So you can provide information to the mother as shown earlier in MedGen. You also can get a hold of the uncle's autopsy report, which does not confirm sudden cardiac death from dissecting thoracic aneurysm, but it doesn't mention any marfanoid features. So additional testing on this child indicates that his myopia is greater than three diopters, but the slit lamp examination is negative for ectoptic bluntness. His echo is normal with no mitral valve prolapse, and he has a normal aortic root diameter. So his mother wasn't ready at this time to pursue additional imaging to evaluate um, for lumbosacral dural ectasia, and his father's not available for examination since the parents are estranged. So as of now, the patient doesn't yet meet the published criteria for Marfan syndrome, though he is young enough for additional features to develop later on. So even with the additional workup, your differential diagnosis hasn't changed much, and Marfan syndrome still seems the most likely. So you could decide to follow the patient over time, but since he's here for a medical release to play sports, uh, your concerns over his family history and the continued possibility of an EDS type 4 diagnosis, you and his mother decide to initiate genetic testing. And so ideally, you want to find a panel that covers the genes for all of the conditions in your differential diagnosis. So you can go directly to the GTR homepage to start your search, but since you're already familiar with MedGen, you can transfer to the GTR by clicking one of the links on the right side panel. And this section gives a breakdown of tests for Marfan syndrome by methodology. So you could choose a specific method, but for this case, since you want a wide-reaching panel, you can click the link See All to see all tests available in the GTR that test for Marfan syndrome. So now this is a page from the GTR. It shows you all 77 tests that list for Marfan syndrome, and that includes any panels. The first three conditions and test targets are listed in the summary page, in addition to the methods performed during testing. You can also narrow your search results by using the filters on the left such as specific methodologies and lab location. If you want to see a more direct comparison of labs offering tests for a condition, you can click the condition name and then the Compare Labs button as shown on the left. So if we did click that Compare Labs button, um, you can now see all of the labs and what they are offering uh, by scanning across methods. So each row in this grid may actually represent more than one test. But again, you can limit your test results using the filters on the left. And finally, you can click to see which labs offer custom prenatal and or custom carrier testing for the condition. So another effective way to find tests in GTR is to use the genes tab and the autocomplete dictionary to search for a gene symbol. You can start typing FB in the search bar, 
and then select FBN1 from the Dynamic Autocomplete Dictionary. And you're then taken to a gene record in the Genetic Testing Registry. The gene page for FBN1 provides a lot of valuable information about the gene, including the various phenotypes associated with it. There are also helpful molecular resources located on the right-hand panel. There's also a link to test for this gene in GTR. And so clicking this link would give you a test result page similar to what you saw before. And so before we move on, I want to show you some other ways to quickly find tests using the Genetic Testing Registry. So here are some interesting statistics from the GTR uh, current as of this June. So there are almost 19,000 registered genetic tests. The GTR is the only registry of tests to also incorporate pharmacogenetic tests and somatic cancer tests. We're seeing more and more complex panels with the rise of next generation sequencing, and currently the GTR has over 2,000 tests that have two or more test targets. Whole exome sequencing is offered by 27 labs, and seven labs have registered that they perform whole, exome, whole genome sequencing. Uh, GTR also allows labs to report any additional services that they offer, as shown here at the bottom of the slide. The GTR help documentation can assist you in further navigating the GTR, and the advanced search is a great way to find precisely the test that you need. So the link to the GTR advanced search is in the upper left of many pages, including the home page. As you build, you can build the search any way you like, choosing from the drop-down menu of options to include in your search, such as condition name, number of genes tested, and the test methodologies. So here we'll enter our search criteria and click the search button. Our search results come up, and we can narrow our result list using the filters on the left. I'd like to point out the filter under laboratory. So you can designate your favorite laboratories in this filter by logging in with your MyNCBI account. And creating this account is free. And what this will do is it will cause your favorite labs to rise to the top of any search results when it's active and you're logged in. So from here, we're going to choose a test to look at in more detail. So a disclaimer on the next few slides. Uh, the tests shown today are not endorsed by the NIH. They're being displayed to you to show the resource, and since not all tests share the exact same features, you'll see a screenshot of some different tests just for the sake of this presentation. You can navigate to different sections of the test record using the tabs at the top of the record. We're currently on the overview page, and for this panel, you can see the conditions in our differential. On the right-hand side of every test page, there are pre-computed links to resources provided by NCBI. These resources contain items that may be useful for you when evaluating the test and conditions or the test targets within the test. So a closer look at the information on the right-hand right side of most GTR pages is provided here. So the sections are called discovery panels, and the content of the panel does slightly change depending on which page you're on. For example, whether you're on a condition page or a gene page. So the panel begins with reviews of interest. And for example, a direct link to a gene reviews article or a pre-filled clinical query in PubMed. There are clinical resources such as links to OMIM disease records and studies in clinicaltrials.gov. There are manually curated articles of interest, and as well, associated practice guidelines. Hovering over these links gives you the full text and titles. Uh, further down the discovery panel are molecular resources, uh, such as links to the OMIM gene records. And then finally, there are links to consumer resources. And these resources provide you with information that can be quickly printed and provided to your patients. So I want to highlight that the articles in the suggested reading and practice guidelines sections are manually curated. And again, if you hover over a particular entry, such as the American Heart Association link here, 
the full title of the guideline is displayed. And clicking the link will take you to the article. So this article here is especially important to us to help with our recommendations for or against our patient playing sport. On the How to Order tab, you'll find information on the sample and ordering requirements, as well as a test-specific contact if provided by the lab. The Indication tab provides a list of all conditions associated with this test in addition to greater details on the condition marked as primary for the test. There's also information on the target population and the clinical validity and utility for the test, again, as provided by the test submitter. So a note, this information is only displayed if the laboratory provided it. So the methodology tab displays the methods used during testing and a summary of what is tested. And there's also information supplemented by NCBI, such as sequence location. So after assessing this panel test, you determine that it does cover all of your needs. You have the information necessary to order the test, and you, you get the results back. So after getting the results back, you might need some help interpreting them. And this is where ClinVar comes in. So ClinVar is a freely available public archive database of genetic variants and their relationship to phenotype. It's a new resource launching last year, and therefore it's not yet comprehensive. It does contain both short variants and copy number variants, as well as large variants. And this is the ClinVar homepage. So currently there's more than 117,000 submissions uh, representing over 100,000 variants in uh, over 18,000 genes. There are a variety of submitters. So OMIM is the largest submitter with variants taken from the OMIM allelic variant record. There are also clinical testing laboratories, research laboratories, and expert curation groups uh, such as the ICCG, as well as gene reviews and locus-specific database. Before launching into the website, I wanted to give you some background so you knew what you're looking at when you're reading a variant record. So ClinVar integrates four domains of information, variation, phenotype, the interpretation of how that variant relates to that phenotype, as well as the evidence that supports that interpretation. And ClinVar is integrated with many other resources, as shown here, both within NCBI and externally including dbSNP, dbVar, and NCBI gene. MedGen by proxy incorporates HPO, or the Human Phenotype Ontology, and OMIM. Practice guidelines and professional society statements, such as those from ACMG on incidental findings, are incorporated, and references from PubMed and so on. So throughout NCBI resources, there are many connections, thereby making it easier for you to quickly locate the information you're looking for. So it's the combination of variation and phenotype is what defines an accession from a submitter in ClinVar. So let's say that ClinVar has received a submission from Lab A, which states the variant C.4786 C to T is pathogenic for Marfan syndrome. The submission of that variant plus the phenotype plus the submitter name is accessioned by ClinVar and it's given a unique code which starts with SCV. So SCV stands for Submitted ClinVar Record. We might also get another submission about that same variant but from a different lab, Lab B, and because that is a unique combination of variant, phenotype, and submitter, this entry gets a different SCV number. This system allows for us to track individual submissions. So one of the values that ClinVar adds to the data is that we aggregate submitter similar data, so that in this case, the variant to phenotype relationship is summarized and aggregated into a higher level accession, and it's given an RCV code, or reference ClinVar record. And this is important to understand because the aggregate record, again, the RCV accessions, are what are displayed by default in ClinVar. So part of the information provided in the aggregate record is review status. 
This gives you an idea of the level of confidence you can have in the clinical assertion being made for that phenotype to variant pair. It tells you the level of review that has gone into that assertion, as well as if there are any conflicting interpretations about the pathogenicity of the variant. So we use both a text and an icon to show review status. And this is an example of the heading from a ClinVar record. And this is a CFTR variant in its relationship to cystic fibrosis. You can see that for this record, the review status is a single star, and that indicates only a single submitter has classified this variant to phenotype. As you can see, they classified it as a variant of unknown significance. In comparison, this record for a PTPN11 variant and its relationship to rhizopathy has two stars which means that multiple submitters have provided us with information about this variant and its phenotype. It also means that they all agree on what the clinical significance is. So in this case, multiple submitters have said this variant is pathogenetic for rhizopathy. So you might have more confidence in records with two stars over those with a single star. Uh, records with three stars have been reviewed by expert panels. And by expert panels, we mean a well-established group that has expertise in the field of both the gene and the phenotype. They've done extensive curation, and they've established criteria that they use to make an evaluation of the pathogenicity. The example here is a CFTR variant that was submitted um, according to the ACMG guidelines. Four stars is our highest review status. And these are for variants that have been submitted by a professional society that provides practice guidelines for these variants. Um, I'm sorry, this example shown here is one of the 23 CFTR mutations that ACMG recommends for carrier screening for cystic fibrosis. There's also an option for a variant record to have no stars. This indicates that we have information about this variant from multiple submitters but the clinical significance calls or the interpretations differ. We can't determine what the clinical significance is, and thus we give all submitted interpretations for your review and display our review status as zero stars. So in addition to aggregating data, another function of ClinVar is to provide standardization of the data. I think we've all had the experience of dealing with genes and phenotypes and quickly realizing that they can have many different names. It can be very difficult to determine what people are talking about when they use different names. An example here is shown on the left. This is a list of names used to describe the exact same variant, many submitted by testing laboratories. So ClinVar provides standardization of these names on different scales such as chromosome level, protein level, for example, so that users can talk and understand explicitly which variant each is referring to. ClinVar provides HGVS expressions in genomic coordinates, cDNA coordinates, protein coordinates, as well as dbSNP identifiers. So now we'll get back to our case scenario. So, so far we used MedGen to research the phenotype. We looked through GTR to find the appropriate test. We ordered that test, and we received back the lab report. And the variant in the report is C.4786 CT in the FBN1 gene. And you'd like to find out more information about this variant. And of course, what I've been leading up to is that ClinVar is a great place to go and look up that information. So you can start at the ClinVar homepage. There are links to documentation about using ClinVar, as well as links to related tools and resources. Like many NCBI resources, ClinVar uses a search bar at the top of the page where you can put in any search term. For our purposes today, we'll start by searching for the FBN1 gene that our variant of interest is in. When you search for FBN1, you get many results, and they're presented as a table. There are several columns of information to help you narrow your result set. There are filters on the left that let you further narrow down your search results. And for example, you can use the filters to find only pathogenic variants in FBN1 or only those classified by multiple submitters. When you've picked out a record you'd like to see in more detail, you can click the See Details link to see the full variant record. 
And in this example, I provided FBN1 as a broad search term, but you can also put in a more specific search term, like the exact name of the variant you're interested in. And ClinVar does support searching for variants by many possible different formats, as shown here. So here is a variant record page for our variant identified during testing. This detailed display is the aggregate record as indicated with its RCV number. The top section provides information on the interpretation, including the clinical significance and the review status. It also provides the date this variant was last updated. So in our example, the C.4786 C to T variant in the FBN1 gene is pathogenic for Marfan syndrome. This was submitted by multiple submitters, resulting in a two-star review status designation. Uh, the next section provides general information about the allele. It gives the HGVS expressions as well as the predicted molecular consequence and allele frequency when it is available. There's also a general section with information about the phenotype, including links for more information. And you can see at the bottom of the screenshot, there are some tabbed headings. So if you were actually to scroll down the page, you'd see something like this. And the first of these tabs is a clinical summary of all the assertions we've received for this phenotype variant pair. So in this case, two labs submitted information on this variant, LabCorp and Partners Healthcare. And you can see that each lab submission has its own unique SCV number. The table provides what each lab gave in regards to the variance interpretation and when it was the last evaluated, as well as the allelic origin and methods used to detect the variant. So labs can provide the molecular consequence in addition to references backing up their clinical significance calls. And the second tab is the genome view, which I'm not going to show today, uh, but it does provide a graphical representation of the variant in its genomic context on the chromosome using NCBI's Sequence Viewer. So if you were to click on the third tab uh, titled Evidence, you'd see what submitters provided as evidence support their clinical assertion. And ClinVar presents this tab as a summary from all submitters at the top, and then it's followed by links to relevant citations. At the bottom, there's a menu that you can click open to see the individual submitter submission. And here you see the details of what data was provided in the latest submission. Uh, they can provide data into structured fields, as shown in the table, or as free text in the description section. So one more thing to note about the detailed display is that if there are practice guidelines available for the phenotype and variant in question, NCBI does make that available to you. Uh, the page shown is for cystic fibrosis, but it shows you you can get directly to the practice guideline. So, so I showed you earlier how ClinVar aggregates individual assertions of variant to phenotype relationships. From what we've learned from users, often they want to search ClinVar and see all of the information that's been submitted for that variant, and not just for a single variant to condition. So in my example, we looked for a variant in FBN1 and its relationship to Marfan syndrome. But in fact, ClinVar also has information on this variant and its relationship to Lou's Dietz syndrome. And since you don't want to have to look at individual records and instead you want to see all submitted information on that variant, ClinVar has thus aggregated information also at the variant level. So, uh, again, you can arrive directly to variant records by searching ClinVar on the variant name. So here is a variant-specific record in ClinVar. And this view is different from the page we looked at earlier by clicking See Details on the Variant to Phenotype RCV page. The data is more focused here on the variant. It gives the HGVS expressions and info on the gene or genes the variant is in. So similar to the RCV page, there is interpretation information on the variant. There's a section with general information on the allele. And if this variant allele has been reported in combination with another allele, that's described in the complex allele section located in the upper right of the page. And similar to the RCV page, there are tabs at the bottom. The tabbed headings are the same as on the RCV page. The Clinical Assertions tab provides all the data from the submissions we've received. But in this review, because it is a variant-specific display, the phenotypes submitted are also listed here. 
And if you go over to the Evidence tab, this is streamlined support provided by the submitters. So again, ClinVar can be searched by gene symbol, HGBS expressions, protein changes, phenotype, and by submitter name. But please note, the search uses exact words and it's not field specific. So sometimes this can make for broader search results than you expect. Uh, but again, you can use the filters or the advanced search to narrow your results. I wanted to show you some other ways you might approach finding information in ClinVar. So as whole exome and whole genome sequencing is becoming more common, uh, reporting incidental findings is a hot topic for many of you in the field, especially following ACMG's recommendations for reporting incidental findings. ClinVar realizes this is of great interest to users, so right on the home page is a link that goes to a table listing all of the genes in ACMG's recommendation. There are links to find out more information on the genes and their associated conditions, as well as links to reported variants in those genes in ClinVar. The FBN1 gene is on this list, and you can quickly click the link to see all of the FBN1 variants submitted to ClinVar. So another tool at NCBI that can assist you in evaluating long lists of variants, such as those identified during whole exome or whole genome sequencing, is the Variation Reporter. It allows for looking at such information in bulk. So you can upload a list of variants as their HGBS expressions, and it returns to you a table like the one shown, letting you know all of the information that NCBI knows about these variants. If we don't know about the variant, we can at least give you some basic information, such as the predicted molecular consequence. If we do know about it, we can give you information on genomic location and whether or not it's located in dbSNP or dbBAR. So there's other further information relevant to clinical viewers, such as the global minor allele frequency, or GMAF, whether there's detailed data in ClinVar on that variant, in addition to PubMed IDs at references provided by submitters or data mining. We do have some upcoming improvements to ClinVar. There's going to be an HGBS sense, uh, sensor. There's going to be a protein change sensor, so you can uh, search on just a partial protein change query, uh, an example here, ARG911. And there's going to be um, a phenotype query. This is some information on accessing ClinVar data. Um, you can always go to the web to look up individual, but you can also download um, monthly full releases of the XML, VCF files, and tab delimited summary files. Um, again, you can use annotation on NCBI's graphic sequence displays or use Variation Viewer and Variation Reporter. So today we've seen several resources to assist us in our case scenario. We've used MedGen to get information on the phenotype and differential diagnosis as well as to locate the Ghent criteria for Marfan syndrome. We use GTR to find appropriate tests and get additional information that can be provided to consumers. We've also used ClinVar to research variant pathogenicity and to find out what other views of pathogenicity of this variant are and any evidence to support some claims. So hopefully this has empowered you to make your recommendation for the patient. Uh, the finding of a pathogenic mutation, FBN1, with the other clinical features, now provides enough evidence using the Ghent guidelines to fulfill a diagnosis of Marfan syndrome. Uh, here are the exercise recommendations, and you can see that the most high-intensity competitive sports are not recommended for individuals with Marfan syndrome. So although this news is likely crushing at the time to this child, uh, you know you've played a part in saving his life. So there is even more resources available for you to access for free. Uh, if you can't remember to find the links, you can always go to NCBI's homepage, and on the left-hand side, click the section for genetics and medicine. So here are just some of the staff at NCBI that work on these great resources. Uh, additionally, two of my colleagues are joining me today to assist in our question session, uh, Melissa Landrum and Adriana Malhero. And to end with, I'm going to leave you a list of some of the websites that we reviewed today. If you have any comments, questions, or you want to submit to any of these websites, uh, please feel free to contact me. Uh, my email is brandy.catman at nih.gov. And again, thank you so much for your attention. Well, thank you, Brandy.
That was fantastic. Uh, as somebody said, marvelous. What we're going to do at this point is we're going to have two 30-second polls, and then we're going to ask some of the very interesting questions that were asked by audience members. So if people can hang on, answer two 30-second polls. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the first poll now. And so if you can please tell us uh, the resources you've used prior to the webinar. This helps us to design our resources, and this will also help us to design future webinars. All right, that's great. I'm going to switch to the next poll. Thanks, everybody, for staying on the line. So I have one interesting question here, and you guys can continue to send your questions in. But I have one very interesting question here that I think I'm going to direct to Melissa Landrum. And that question is, will all variants be given RS numbers? And what about HGM, HGMD mutations that do not have RS numbers? So I'll address the second part of that question first. Um, we do not have uh, data from HGMD in ClinVar, so we are unable to make the connections between um, HGMD mutations and an RS number that potentially represents them. However, um, when variants are submitted to ClinVar, we do make the connection between that variant and any existing RS number, so we do know if it's represented by an existing record in dbSNP. If it's not, we broker the submission to dbSNP so that all of the short variants in ClinVar are also represented by a record in dbSNP. And incidentally, we do the same thing for large structural variants and dbVar. If any structural variant is submitted to ClinVar, we also broker its submission to dbVar if it's not already represented in that database. Thank you, Melissa. Are there any more questions for Brandy or Melissa or Adriana? All right, great. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact NCBI. We always want to hear user feedback on our resources. And with that, I'll thank everybody for coming, and we will sign off of this webinar.